Welcome to the Robot Philosophy Podcast, where we keep you up to date on the latest news, reviews, and anything new in the robot world. Right, hi guys, uh, it's Philip English, uh, RoboPhil uh, from uh, Robot Philosophy Podcast. Uh, we're here today uh, with Florin from uh, Muddy Machines, uh, just to learn a little bit more about Muddy Machines and uh, what their team is uh, is up to. Um, so I'll probably um, kick off just straight away with just, um, yeah, could, 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 could you give us just a general um like intro florin of uh, obviously what um the uh, what uh, m- m- money machines is about so. yeah of course phil thanks for having me on it's a pleasure to be here I've seen lots of your um videos so far very interesting founders on there um yeah so money machines is a is an ag tech uh, robotics company um we build robots that are about like 180 by 180 big so quite quite sizable machines. Here's a, here's a cat picture of what Sprout uh, looks like. Um, and, and these robots, um, I mean, why do we do what we do? Um, there is a massive labor shortage in, in farming. I mean, all robotics companies, I guess, tackle labor shortages in one way or another. But in farming, we're really coming to a place where growers are stopping the production of certain crops because they are too labor intensive. Um, you have something like 50, 60% of the production cost being labor. If you can't get your um, seasonal labor force in because of Brexit, because of COVID and general, you know, the, the, the price that you can pay per hour isn't exactly going up with um, supermarket price pressures exerted on growers. Uh, you just end up with uh, what growers have been telling us, a 30 to 50% shortage of labor force, right? And then you're sitting on your crop and it's literally rotting away in the field. It's actually a great weather this year mm. for some growers. They get, they get very high yields. <laughs> Water is a bit of an issue too now um, as it continues. But um, if you can't harvest your crop, you're making an outright loss instantly. Um, and so we think that this is something that hasn't sufficiently addressed yet with, uh, with uh, robotics technology. Yes, there are plenty of machinery out there that do combine harvesting where the crop has a very uniform growing pattern and you can pull the trigger on a certain day and say now get me all my barley get me all my wheat you have these big you know combine harvesters going through the field but with vegetables with fruit berries you need to really go in and say okay so is this one ripe then I'll pick it put it in my basket and then leave the rest to ripen for another couple of days and that's something that hasn't been done by any of these um, traditional OEMs in agriculture so far. And that's where Muddy Machine comes in with uh, with Sprout. Right, fantastic. Fantastic. That's a great uh, like intro, Florence. So thanks for that. I mean, so what's um so what's your background? I, I understand that you you come that the family comes from a farming sort of, sort of, sort of background, and then and then at, at, at the same time you've got a co-founder, Chris. So I was interested in his sort of background as well. So. Yeah, so we're 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 two people, uh, Chris and and me. Um, Chris is the CTO. He's the one with the robotics background. He has uh, spent quite a long time at, uh, at Dyson. Uh, he's got some, spent some time at uh, Deliveroo building uh, automated kitchens. He's done some work in, um, I think, field search and rescue robots. So he really straddles. It was like I call him like a full stack robotics engineer, right? He can do, he has, he can do everything. He has built our first prototype, Sprout. Uh, Mark one um, by himself, 100% <laughs> last year. Um, and now we finally have, you know, a big enough, big enough team to bring in, you know, specialists, mechatronics engineers, specialists, computer vision, et cetera, to really um, leverage his, his skills wider. Um, and yeah, I take care of everything on the, on the business side. I'm a um, economics uh, business student by by training um, i've been um, in many different startups over the last 10 10 15 years really across the the spectrum of um e-commerce software as a service uh, fintech um and yeah you mentioned my family farming background i mean credit to my in-law family um they are the ones that uh, got into farming probably about a decade ago um in it's in portugal actually they they um, Portugal wasn't doing so well for for a while, as you remember, and there was a lot of um, land or, or, or derelict farms, um, you know, 
available um, where the business have been completely mismanaged, was in disarray, and um, they have taken on it's over 1,500 hectares in, in, in the Alentejo region. Mm. It's mostly um, cattle, um, so open field grazing, so very, very sustainable if you do it right, uh, and an and olive orchard. And that really got me thinking into, okay, so what what is the kind of business stuff that I know? And then got us insight into farming and then realized the massive potential for building something that is long-term sustainable, mm -hmm. but at the same time has very long planning horizons, right? So if the first thing we have to do is ensure the water supply or the, or the, 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 the land is healthy enough again to retain water. We have a big drought issue in, in Portugal. And mm. then you make some investments that, that, that sometimes take 10, 15 years to pay back. Um, and now we're slowly in a place where the thing is commercially viable again, and and we can we can uh, you know reinvest in it. Um, and then when when it when I had a point in my life where I was okay, what what's my next startup? Um, I said okay, I think I really want to be in the agricultural world and adding some value there with the with the skills that I have. Um, but building an app <laughs> or something that um, would be would be something that I could probably do quickly by myself. I think this has been attempted already to mix success. So it was pretty clear to me that if you go, if you want to bring technology into agriculture, if you want to like enable farmers, you know, at that time we didn't even, I didn't even know about the labor, the labor issues in, in vegetable growing. I said, okay, so if you want to do something in this space, you need to be a really deep tech person that does something transformational. And then when I spoke to Chris and, and and understood what like what the state of the art with robotics is, then we had a shared conviction of okay, so we want to do something in agriculture. We want to do something that really moves the needle for for people working in that industry. What could that be? And then with his background of robotics, you know, when you then speak to growers, what's your problem? And you start hearing labor shortages, labor shortages. Yeah. Then you're like, okay, so this is obviously something. That we could take a look at and then in the middle of COVID, we did a field visit with a very very large asparagus grower here in the uk we got a i think we got a special permit to drive out in in, in may 2020 with a with a gopro camera and a, and, a, and a 3d camera and just started to take some pictures of crop in the field to see can we actually see this mm -hmm. can we with a reasonable effort require uh, record good enough image data uh, and that was successful. I mean, it was far from perfect, right? We were like, okay, cool. So this this works. Now, can we mock up something that grabs, like, can we build some kind of end effector solution? And then we iterated through, and a year later, we had something that, that uh, was a very decent pro uh, proof of concept, um, looked a lot different from what the, the picture I've just shown you. It was very, like, bolted together with aluminum intrusions and all that. But yeah, it, uh, it, it was enough to see yes, this could potentially work. Now you just need to make it faster, more robust. And um, it, that's that's when it that gets really, really hard as any any person knows to who's, who's tried to build a robot with commercial specifications that although in last year we had something that proved the concept, we did a lot of work on the machine that we put into the field this year, but that still, again, needs... The, the last five percent are the are the hardest, right? To to get it to the right pick speed, the right operational time, the robustness against the elements, and 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 all that. So, yeah, that's kind of our 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 story, our backgrounds, um, where we've come from. We met we met at Entrepreneur First, um, right. which was a great program to you know get people like me to meet people like Chris, right? Right, and, and is it? Yeah. And is that based in London? Then is it that on, on they, yeah, the main the main uh, or the original program is based in London? I think they have cohorts in 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 Berlin uh, and a couple of other major cities as well now. Hmm. Um, and it's 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 great. Um, I can I can highly recommend it if you are. I mean, from from my point of view, right? If you if you have a business background, you're kind of always ready to go to start a business. Um, but there are many technical people that get very tempted by high paying jobs in in, in bigger corporates um yeah. and I, I know engineers have also typically a higher requirement for you know job security continuity uh etc and you get you get addicted to that right and so entrepreneur first they're trying to 
to rescue people from the from the corporate ladder and get them into <laughs> a, a safe space where it's like, okay, here's a here's a stipend, here's a program, we'll teach you how to start up, and, and here's someone who could be your your co-founder um, as a as a CEO or COO, and, and you can do this together. Right. Cool. No, that's a great overview. Uh, thanks, Florian. So so I suppose uh, I know you've discussed about the um, yeah, some 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 of the problems. So if you if you're going to enhance it down to sort of three three key issues that we've seen in the in in in, in the in the farming industry, like could you go through that with us? So. Yeah. So again, the biggest one for us uh, was the obvious labor shortage and the imminent um, losses of of revenue um, that that come with it. Um, but if you think about what does it mean if a UK grower stops the production of a certain type of vegetable, right? We're still, supermarkets are still going to offer this, still going to want to provide this to the consumer. And then that means that we're going to increase the number of vegetables that we import. Some of them need to stay fresh and you have to air freight them in. So when you're buying, for example, asparagus from Peru, yeah, you, are, you need to air freight these in because they go off very, very quickly. Um, and then you have a five times higher carbon footprint on the kilo of produce right. imported versus domestic. And so this is something that I believe with a, with a you know, conscious mind, you mustn't let happen that we become increasingly dependent on carbon intensive food mile heavy imports, watching your domestic production industry, you know, die. Um, and then in the long run, we are faced with massive global population increases. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it is going to be possible in, at infinity to be reliant on food imports. You know, every single hectare that we can sustainably um, farm here, we should retain that. Because at some stage, an exporter country like Peru or even, or even Spain, right, who are having, they have ma massive uh, water shortages and will not be able to export at that volume for forever. Um, you know, what we see with gas today, we might see with, with fresh produce in, in, a, in a couple of years. So I think it's absolutely vital to build something that allows the domestic or in, allows the continuation of domestic production um, in the UK, but also in, in many other countries. Um, and if you, like the third problem that you, that you have in, in farming is Yes, technology is getting built, but is it actually making your, your process better? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the answer has been, okay, it's expensive to have a person on a tractor to um, go up and down the field doing harvesting. Oh, let's build a bigger tractor, right? Let's bigger, bigger, build a bigger combine. Mm -hmm. And the, this causes a lot of soil compaction, which reduces the amount of water that a that a, um, a soil can contain, uh, can retain. So you have bigger desertification and runoff. Compaction also massively reduces the amount of um, biomass that is in the soil. So you need to combat that with additional use of um, expensive and chemical fertilizer, reducing your profits again. And so what's the, what's the upshot of this? So you, you need to be very careful not to build a solution that, okay, it, it might do automated picking, but it's so heavy that it compacts the soil even more than it is already uh, getting done these days. Thanks. And so this is from our design principles, right? We need to have something that can compete or at least be cost competitive with labor. And right? if I offer growers a robot that costs 10 times as much per kilo of produce harvested, well, then, you know, I haven't really improved the situation. Mm -hmm. If I give them something that is um, very bulky, very heavy, aside from all these risks of single point of failure, massive complex machines, the soil compaction alone is going to reduce their yields or co increase costs on other ends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so these are kind of, this is kind of the framework that you, that we're thinking um, within. Right, perfect. Yeah, no, no that, that's perfect. That, that, that's gone over to the authority and pro problem there and solution there. Okay, no, so we'll see you, you, you've got a nice clear sort of, you know, the, the problems and the solutions for you. I mean, I suppose from Money Machine's point of view, I mean, what, what's the sort of dream then? What, what's the bigger picture? You know, what's the sort of next steps for you guys um, on, your, um, like on your journey for the farming, which, which I totally agree with you. I mean, um, I think like robotics in the farming is, is, is the best like area to be really. 
um, in terms of you know the actual like uses and um, and tech. As soon as we have more and more technology going into that field, then we've really got um, really going to have a lot of like advantages from it. So yeah, I'm keen. I'm keen to see sort of you know what's your plans and sort of next steps you know and road plans for my money machines. So. Yeah, I think we had a couple of tough years um, funding or finding finances for for this project. Um, we are, if, if you're thinking about a traditional software as a service funding story, right? You you need very little money in the beginning to throw together some software, and then at the end, your series A, B, etc. You raise a lot of money to push the product into the market. Um, with uh, robotics, I think it's it's the reverse, right? You have a lot of costs in the beginning to get to a prototype, to get to a commercial viable version. You spend a lot of time just building hardware, a lot of uh, money, you spend a lot of money doing that. But then as you just said, once you have a robot that works, you know, there is no doubt that the market is is, is going to line out the door asking for, for, this, um, for this robot to be available to them, right? So we, we struggled a bit with this kind of, um getting getting money now and making investors understand you will not be paying at infinity once we have the the product market fit of the robot and so for us the that like going forward the 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 biggest um milestone is to actually build a small number of sprouts to really prove that this small ish machine form factor when applied to a swarm or to a herd of robots this can actually operate at scale and deliver the kind of harvest capacity that the that the farmers require um and then we need to um again find investors that then finance the the first production run at scale where we where we need to build 100 or even 200 robots right we have one grower here in the UK, we said, as soon as you have 100 robots, I want them all. I probably need two or 300, but mm. the sooner you can get me uh, a sizable number, uh, the better. And this is a, commercially, this is a dream come true, right? You have a very large, capable, and keen customer. You just, and, and this is, I think, for the next six to 12 months is, is our, our day-to-day challenge. You just have to build a robust and capable machine that can be relied on in this mission critical harvest environment yeah and then does it work with a fleet system so if it, if a customer did buy you know like you know like multiple u- u- units is there is there a fleet system obviously is it may may not be there yet but is that something obviously you guys uh, want to develop or already have like developed yeah absolutely the the robots um we are working on a, a um, fleet management or herd management solution where you assign a certain number of robots to a certain field and they will coordinate based on, you know, not every row is as um, it's going to take the same amount of time as the next row. There might be some more crop density in one row as opposed to the other row. And so you can, you know, the dumb thing would be to just finish one row and stop uh, and, and not do anything until the others have finished in this way. Uh, we believe we can get some efficiencies of um, to, like divide and conquer uh, work in the field. Um, you mentioned buying a, a robot. I think this is an important point to, to call out. We see this as a um, robotics as a service or hardware as a service um, business because our, I think I mentioned this, our first crop is green asparagus, but we, are, we don't want to stop there, right? We want to enable the harvest capacity for a variety of different labor intensive crops we have some innovate uk funded research projects in courgettes we in in, in, in tend to stem broccoli as well mm. if you look at the farming calendar asparagus is only like three months of the year one of the first crops in the uk that comes into harvest mm. and then this ends in june and then from june to november you have other crops like for example courgettes that are sequentially being harvested for the for the rest of the year in different um in different uh, rotations um and so we 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 see sprout the the robot as a platform to be able to mount or or be tooled with different types of harvest solutions that can be swapped out when you're done with the asparagus season 
you swap the tool and you send it into a courgette field and you you do you busy the rest of the year there um but this only works if you actually keep owning the robot as muddy machines and the and the grower pays you um a, a usage base uh, fee yeah actually quite similar to how they run with with people right they don't they don't own the workers they they pay them an hourly rate and a bit of piece rate etc uh and then also the workers move on right when the asparagus harvest is done uh, these yeah. workers go into blueberries rhubarb uh, what, whatever is the next crop that that farmer grows mm. and i think this lends itself very very nicely to to a robotics business where you always struggle with expensive machine limited use case how can you make the use the application big enough um for 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 this solution not to be prohibitively expensive yeah no that's right and i i i must admit i have seen the the the, the robots as a service uh, like model has obviously been around for a while but i've i have seen a lot more companies um and just the industry in general is trying to push to, to to towards it for those reasons really i mean one of them being that the, the technical side obviously you know if uh, if they buy a robot then you need to have the technical expertise in-house to make sure that, that it's actually managed wherever it's as a service obviously that comes with the package and uh, and and you and you have a whole team of people like behind you they're actually servicing machines so you can focus on your business and getting the results that you want instead of becoming the, a robot business it is somewhat common already with um pack house appliances you know if you have like a big uh, grading belt or like a washing um solution for your vegetables mm. yes they the, the 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 growers buy these but there's a very large annual service fee involved in that i mean they mm. the the oem is not able to take the pack street out of the warehouse and put it somewhere else right but with the robot you actually can do that so it makes more sense to 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 not actually sell the robots but say okay we are just as interested as you are in this thing working for every single minute where there's something in harvest yeah uh, the small form factor makes it actually possible for us to have units spare in stock to to swap out while we are fixing something if if your combine harvester breaks in in harvest season and you're out for a day or two you might lose hectares and hectares of of um, production um and it, so far, the farmers are quite receptive to this to this concept, right? To to understand that we we only earn if if you earn, um, and we're not going to ask you to do any kind of major um, maintenance on these on these robots. If if you have a guy that knows how to get a tractor back up and running, that guy will be more than capable to. I mean, what are the basic maintenance things like? Maybe swap a wheel, um, or yeah. or, or do some basic stuff if the mm -hmm. The actual control unit breaks right of course we 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 could we could potentially even just ship the ship the part or have a part in a spare and that you can um swap out quite quickly um with a couple of bolts i think a, a tractor is much more complex <laughs> than a ev robot right okay okay and, and then what's the um how long does it take to get the robot working then is it is it like so if i just you know if i had a field i wanted to go in there and, and get it working in the field is there cer certain sort of measurements that you have to take or is it like you get you, the robot does the measurements how, how how long does it take to get it going um th this is something we need to really figure out um as we go into fields that we're not familiar with um in in principle with something like asparagus the nice thing is that for seven years you have the same rows six or seven years so you have the same plants in the ground so even if worst case on the first day all you do is drive the robot up and down all the rows so that it records the the waypoints you can use that map for as long as these asparagus crowns stay in the ground um we we don't change farm very often with these robots right so we can afford to have a relatively high setup um times um, of course, we want to be able to just get a um, ask the farmer, OK, you surely have RTK GPS maps of your fields when you did your seeding or your cultivation. Let's just integrate those. Um, we can set um, boundaries on things like Google Maps or other GPS maps that they may have to understand, OK, what what area does the robot absolutely not? Is the robot not allowed to leave You know, from a security point of view? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in a, the setup 
the initial setup of a field within one day um you are you are more than capable of of then operating um what we are very mindful of is before we start working with a new grower is to first actually see what is the infrastructure that is in place is there a shed where we could have overnight storage and uh, charging power how far is this shed away from the next field and in all the fields yeah so can mm -hmm. can the machine drive itself there do we have to think of another storage solution further away or or a um, load them up on a trailer in the morning right those are those are the interesting operational bits um in the us you have 50 miles sometimes before you hit the hit the next kind of power source um oh, wow. th those are those are challenges that um we need to figure out i mean is there solar is there is there some other power source that we can use uh should we go in and, s and swap out the batteries lots of lots of open interesting questions um that you can only solve when you work very very closely with with the growers with the actual growers yeah okay now that makes sense makes sense is a is there a solar powered one is it is it is it is it is that possible for to take enough power from the sun or is it you, you will need some form of of additional battery I mean, solar is making massive increases in in efficiency, et cetera, every year. So I think there's going to be a there's going to be a day where you can power a harvest robot on solar. I don't think this is currently possible. Um, I know that there are some weeding robots that do a lot less uh, complex um, mechanical uh, bits than than we do, and they also don't have to drag the the weight of the crop around. Um, so I think we're. This is something that can be supplemental uh, as a power source. Right. Um, the other thing with with robots in the field is you need to do all your calculations and computing on the edge. You cannot rely on a steady five G internet connection. You can do this in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. um, so you see quite. You'll see in the greenhouse. You'll see much lighter robots because you have yeah Wi Fi even right. Um, and in the field, you need to do everything on the machine, and that also takes a lot of power. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I I did have a few extra things. I mean, so um, obviously you, you discussed about robots as a service for for, for farming, and that's the route for like my, uh, for for like money machines, um, precision harvesting. So I'm guessing, uh, from what I understand, obviously th this is where. The, the, the machine can actually check you know the sprout or the or the, the vegetable that it's looking at to see if it's ripe before actually um taking it out of the ground um so that that that's it that's in built in, in into the machine and i guess there's some sort of vision system to, to to have a look at it and sit from there i mean we have we have three um core technology aspects right so one we have the, the what we call sprout the autonomous electrically powered robot platform how does that get across terrain how much battery power is on there how resistant is this to to weather etc the next one is the like you said the, the vision system so on the machine cameras of different specifications that look at the crop i mean we also look what's around the robot so we don't injure anyone but yeah. specifically looking at the crop and learning okay this is crop this isn't crop um, and if it is crop, is it within specification that the pack house is going to want it? Yeah, yeah. So essentially how you also train, and this can take weeks for people even, right? How you train a, an algorithm that understands, okay, so the asparagus spear I'm looking for is at least 16 centimeters long. It shouldn't be too bendy. It shouldn't have any flowering. Um, and if I then want to take that, then you come into the third area of, how do I actually get it out of the field? You know, where, at what, how do I grip it? How do I cut it off? Do I twist it off? Do I chop it? All of these things um, without damaging not yet ripe crop around it, right? Yeah. You wouldn't cut off an apple tree just to get one apple. And yeah, yeah. similarly with, with, the, with the field vegetables, one spear is good to go. The other one is too small. So how do you get to the bottom of this spear without having the other one being nicked? Because when you nick it, it goes, it, it uh, goes in, a, in a crooked way. I see. So these, these three areas you need to yeah, solve at the same time. I mean, time. always one of them you can, I think we have a very, very good drive train right now. Mm -hmm. And now we can fully focus on the, the, the efficiency and accuracy of the end effector. 
Asparagus was very good in the sense that it doesn't have a foliage uh, coverage. So that the computer vision, I think we, we are in the high 90s now in terms of accuracy. That's really, really good. There are other crops that have leaves uh, that are things that move as you as you get into it mm -hmm. that, that make the, the vision angle a lot more challenging. Um, but I think you can, you probably will never be 100% done with the most performant end effector that is super fast, never breaks, has always got a sharp blade or or a sharp a sharp scissor on it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a good overview. I mean, the the I suppose with the with the development of more cameras, I mean, we've seen from the um, uh, from from the camera side, the vision systems are getting better and better and better. So I guess as that comes along, I suppose you got. Um, a lot more end effectors even you know it's, you, you got the world of haptics as well but that, that 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 probably doesn't quite meet this world but even just the sensibility uh the actual touch of the sensors to it, see. it does it does right i think as these as everything in the robotics world right what we what we're using now would have been unaffordable five years ago and was probably yeah. only used in the defense or nuclear industry 10 years ago right and yeah. and what these guys are using today to clean a nuclear power plant, of course, that would work in the field if you have a quarter million pounds to spend on it, right? I mean, we're, <laughs> with the robot, you're talking more like, okay, so maybe I, can't, maybe I can't even spend 100 grand on one robot, right? That, that, or even maybe I should be spending 10. Um, and the, the really exciting thing is for people coming into this space or out of university is that this is a wave that is currently rolling that we can surf. And this wave is being powered by not only nuclear and defense but actually from the entire ev automotive industry right? we right. we are suffering from parts being unavailable because of china being still in lockdown mm. i know that tesla and vw and, and and who have you are also really concerned about this so they will they will unlock it and we will get our batteries within an under <laughs> under 40 week lead time again yeah um, yeah <laughs> it, it, it's always staggering to to see the opportunities and the the potential right like i said coming into this new uh, as a company or as a person there isn't there aren't too many people around that are you know old gray men that have done this for 30 40 years if you're a smart graduate today do consider <laughs> act like robotics companies um, yeah yeah like coming into it. well this is it i mean as you're saying like you have the aging workforce a lot a lot of the the baby boomer gen gen generation is retiring and when they retire, they retire their skills as well. And and this is um, why I think um, a lot of the robot companies are trying to make it uh, easier for graduates to come into the business with more digital tools for them to learn to actually un, 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 un understand those skills. Um, I mean, the last three questions I did have was um, obviously just 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 going through the details of money machines. So so obviously you guys be, will be able to uh, yield predictions, um, and then. Um, it will see that's intelligence driven by the AI piece and the camera piece, as you were saying. And then I was wondering if you had any quick stats around it, just to say, oh, that this is, um, you know, this is sort of like an example stat wise. Uh, I mean, example stats. So one, one interesting stat is that if you do harvesting in asparagus more accurately than humans, um, for example, cutting the asparagus all, always exactly at ground level and not leaving a stubble. Um, this will get you up to 20% more yield because the, the crown will produce more spears if you stop the photosynthesis. And B, you have more produce on your scale, which is what you get paid for by the supermarket and the produce itself stays fresher if you have a little bit more stem on it. Um, in terms of uh, yield forecasting, uh, we will have to see what, what stats we generate there for growers, right? The nice thing is that yield prediction could probably in itself be a business, but it's just mm -hmm. too expensive to deploy a robot to do just that, right? So our unfair advantage almost is we are building a business that is very viable and profitable because of the harvesting. But the data we are generating is a byproduct, right? Mm -hmm. if we go through the field thinking, okay, can I harvest this? Can I harvest that? We have created a fully real-time yield map of the field already, right? Just in that pass. 
and we're doing it on the next day and the day after as we go back and harvest more, you can actually play that back to the grower and say, here's a real-time yield map of your field. Um, and they can then make much more accurate decisions in terms of when to harvest, how much to harvest, harvest what length to harvest, um, and also then knowing their fields much, much better. Because what you do post-harvest in asparagus, for example, you let it all grow into fern to recharge the, the roots. Mm -hmm. um, and then you fly a drone over and see where the fern growth is very weak. And that is then an area where you should do some intervention. Right. Just control, making the reducing the soil compaction. But this fern takes a couple of weeks to grow. So between stopping to harvest and knowing where are the actual weak spots in your field, several weeks will pass. Mm -hmm. If you have a real-time yield map from our robots, the minute you stop harvesting, you know, okay, this corner of the field over there, these 20, 30 square meters, I have an issue here. Should right. I take it out of production? Can I do something? And you have, you only have between June and February to do anything to your field. Right. Yeah, if, giving them, if, if we're giving them an extra two months to be able to do something, that's a massive advantage. Right. One thing that I mean, we, we work with the largest UK asparagus grower, right? Cobury Farms, they grow 50% of the UK's asparagus. They have a house where they pack 80% of the UK's produce. And they're telling me that if they don't see a like light at the end of the tunnel of the labor issue, um, they will stop production of asparagus within five years, right? So this is, is not a generation away. This is very imminent. We know that um, unharvested vegetables have caused the industry at least 150 million pounds in lost revenues, right? And the, the, the shocking thing here is they have invested in the crop, right? When you can't harvest it, all the money you put into it is, is already lost. And mm -hmm. if you, so in terms of harvest workers, to give you an, an idea, you need about 80,000 people, seasonal workers in the UK per year. Pick for Britain, um, if you recall that campaign, resulted in about 2% of that being filled. And right. we know we know stories like, I had 3,000 people apply. After months of vetting, I had 200 people that were actually suitable. Mm -hmm. And after a week, I had one person left. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's yeah. very, very hard work there in the field. The absurd thing is that, you know, we've left, we left the EU. Um, we have about, we issue now 30,000 or so visas to migrant workers. Mm. Um, that 80, you need 80,000, you issue, issue 30,000 visas. This obviously doesn't quite work. There aren't that many people with previous leave to remain or to come back to fill that gap. Last year, we had half of the workers that came in instead of the Europeans coming in, were from Ukraine. So mm. sadly, this year, the Ukrainians are no longer able to come. And it really feels like if you're a grower that someone's sitting on your chest and just punching you with one bit blow after the other, because what they have now also done is these 40,000, 30,000 visa, um, visas that have been offered, <clears throat> instead of increasing this number, what the government have done is they've actually opened this, this pool up to um, other professions like the, the abattoirs and, and, and other food-related industries. So instead of increasing the visa pool, they've just opened the visa pool up to more industries being able to take from it. Right. Reducing okay. the visas that a, a grower of vegetables can actually take. Even, even ornamental horticulture is in there now as well. Right. So right. Wow, uh, and this is this is staggering. Um, I mean, you, if you if you ask a grower what what else made you angry this year, um, they tried to push in a regulation that um, meant that you have to yes, you can get foreign workers, but you have to pay them more than domestic workers. Right, that would have increased the hourly rates that growers have to pay. I, I believe ten to twenty percent in one go. And this came in after they had already negotiated all the terms for the year with the supermarkets. So they set wow. their prices here, and then the yeah. government said, okay, your cost is going to be here. Um, and it's it's um, you really feel for these guys, right? They really try their best to provide fresh, high-quality produce. Mm. Um, 
but they have they have they are so stuck they have no way out. I mean, it's, it's good for robotics companies. They, they are interested in working with you. Yeah, it's a really desperate situation. Yeah, well, as you said, you know, especially if you're competing for the bigger retailer business, I mean, that alone is a very competitive space. So you know, you, you've probably gone in lean, and then your prices are higher, then you're in trouble straight straight straight, straight yeah. away. So, you're still always at risk of a of a bad year, right? If you if you run out of water, uh, you can't keep growing your crops, then um, you have a big problem. All right, thanks, Florence. So that's uh, that's very very. Um, um, like interesting really to get like, like an insight into sort of you know the farming world i mean so what's the sort of you know like the opportunities and next steps for you for for, for, for like money machines i mean like how do we get in contact with you guys and uh, yeah and, and, and uh, like from that perspective so yeah i mean we're about to launch a couple more positions on our careers page on, on money machines we have a section uh, careers uh we, we want we're really interested in getting some you know year in industry students um as, as soon as possible we are now building a small fleet of robots to go into the field again in, in March time. Um, we need help building them. We need help operating them. Um, so I think this could be a very exciting time for graduates. Uh, we're like, okay, you don't have to know how to design a robot from scratch, but you will actually be working with a robot on a day-to-day -day basis and record the data that it generates and, and help us uh, improve um, their, their performance. Um, and yeah, if you spend an entire year with us, you could potentially see an entire product cycle um, from 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 beginning to end. So get in touch uh, through through our website or hello at at muddymachines.com. Um, this goes directly into my and Chris's inbox, so we'll always uh, pick this up. And yeah, we, we're now a team of um, about twelve people, um, especially interested in anyone with a with a more diverse background it's always very hard to promote especially a uh, female talent in the robotics industry so please sure, do sure. do feel uh, encouraged to uh, to get in touch right perfect perfect well now i was just say um thanks again for, for florin and thank, thanks again for like the overview uh, of money machines very much appreciate your time and uh, yeah 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 like keep us posted i'm sure we're speaking in the future to see how you guys are getting on so thank you very much cheers philip it's a pleasure